Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, uh, Pablo Rodriguez Mier is going to talk about logic modeling of signal signaling networks, Selenop, and Carnival. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Embel DBI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section and that the recording will be, will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Permit COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on the simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical actions. The performance of cell simulation software is still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. Permit COE will scale up the software for cell simulations to the present uh, HPC exascale systems in order to enable the creation of models of cellular functions of medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it will optimize selected cell level simulation software to run in pre exascale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the applications of the Permit COE products in different fields of clinical interest, such as drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling of COVID-19 virus and patients' tissues. Additionally, Permit COE also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals in the use of HPC exascale um, Permit COE tools, integrating the personalized medicine communities into the European HPC exascale ecosystem and building the basis for the sustainability of Permit COE. Today's webinar is part of a first group of webinars presenting the tools developed and optimized in Permit COE. And let me now introduce our speaker, Pablo Rodriguez Mier. Um, is a postdoctoral researcher at the um, Julio Saez Rodriguez Group at the Joint Research Center for, Bio, uh, for Computational Biomedicine. He has a background in computer science and artificial intelligence. Prior to this, he worked at the Food Toxicology Research Center of the French National Institute for Agricultural Research. He was in charge of developing new computational methods to understand metabolic dysregulations in cancer due to mutations in the P53 gene and also in key target genes combining previous biological knowledge with experimental data. So Pablo, the floor is yours. So hi everyone, thanks Daniel for the introduction. So let me share my screen. Okay, hope you can see now my presentation. You should be able to see it in full screen now. Yes. Okay, perfect. So. Well, uh, hi everyone. Thanks for joining this uh, this webinar. So, as Daniel said, my name is Pablo. I'm a postdoc from the uh, Science Rodriguez Group, the Joint Research Center for Computational Biomedicine at the Heidelberg University. And today, I'm going to talk about logic modeling of signaling networks by using uh, two different tools that were developed uh, within the lab, which are Cellnop and Carnival. So. The outline that I prepared for this presentation today is going to be a little introduction about what's contextualization of signaling networks, uh, which is something that those tools are made for. And then I'm going to specifically focus on cell node, which is a, a tool for contextualization of logic-based signaling networks when we have a proteomics or proteomics data. Then I'm going to talk about Carnival, which is a very similar tool, but this time uh, the, what this tool does is contextualization by uh, inferring upstream regulatory signal in bandwidth from downstream uh, transcription, uh, transcription changes from in expression data. And I'm going to show as well some uh, biological applications. So let's start with a little introduction to what's uh, contextualization of signal in networks. So imagine that we want to uh, make a system to predict uh, treatment responses from molecular data. Imagine that we have like different kinds of drugs. I want to predict the response on different uh, cell lines, for example. 
And for this, we can have like perturbational data uh, after treatment with different drugs. We can collect um, different omics data like transcriptomics, proteomics, and so on. And one thing that is typically done is we can just build, for example, statistical models or machine learning models, trying to learn a function that maps from uh, this kind of molecular data to drug response, to an output that can be like, uh, does the cell uh, survive or dies after the treatment, right? But there are some drawbacks to this kind of approaches. Even though we can have like uh, models that are very predictive, uh, in general, they're very hard to interpret. Uh, for many reasons. There are many collinearity between the, the different genes. Uh, we don't have like a causal structure connecting the different variables. So it's very hard to reason about the model. Um, and also we have uh, thousands of features can be like, uh, like a measurement for, for the whole gene, uh, for the whole transcript and, and so on, uh, which makes uh, very hard to learn about the biological functions. Even if we can do predictions, it's hard to make like mechanistic hypothesis out from it. But uh, sometimes uh, we indeed have information about the biological system and the study, right? Imagine that we, we focus on, um, for example, signaling networks, and uh, we don't want only to learn about associations uh, between uh, some features and another, right? We can know about things. For example, we can know that a drug perturbs some, some kind of, of, of protein, and um, so it can, for example, have a, affect some kind of uh, um, receptor that is going to invoke a different kind of e uh, response in, in intracellular, uh, different type of intracellular events in the cell. So different proteins are going to signal information to other, other proteins, and this is going to be, uh, we're going to have an outcome out of that, right? So we already have some kind of information. We know things uh, from previous research uh, about interactions between proteins. So how to combine both things. But this is uh, what this network contextualization is about. So it's basically combining omics data, for example, with prior knowledge network about the biological system in order to generate mechanistic hypothesis. And this has some, some kind of some advantages because in general, what we uh, those methods are is they start with uh, context independent uh, prior knowledge about the, the cells, for example, in mammalian cells, let's say, uh, and then, uh, using the omics data, we are going to select uh, only a part of this prior knowledge network, which is relevant uh, to, to um, which is relevant for, for a mechanistic um, event after some kind of response in the cell. So we move from a thousand of features to maybe only hundreds of proteins that, that can be relevant. So we reduce the dimensionality of the problem uh, by doing this, which also uh, increases the statistical power. And another good thing is we don't only have like a function learned from uh, associations between genes and an outcome, but we have a whole uh, network or a signaling network which offers us a mechanistic, can offer like mechanistic interpretation of what's, what's happening. And of course, we can use also this kind of networks to extract features out from that, like which kind of, of edges or, or proteins are pretty to be active in a particular context. And we connect that with uh, statistical machine learning methods as well to try to. to to learn uh, different kind of responses. So one, one uh, important step to start with this kind of methods is what, what's the prior knowledge network? Where can we find this information, right? So in general, if we search about different kind of pathways, we can find in books and in, in, in search papers and so on, uh, different kind of schematic views uh, of, of, of different uh, pathways in the cell, right? Like here, it is just an example, very schematic representation of the EGFR signaling pathway in which we have some receptor EGFR that uh, different uh, molecules can bind to that, like EGF or EGF uh, alpha. And depending on the on the ligand, uh, different responses are gonna. Uh, so the, the intracellular signaling uh, responses within the cell are gonna be different, right? And it's gonna lead to different outcomes. So we we can know, for example, that the EG, EGF binds to the EGFR receptor. This can trigger some activation of P3K, which can trigger some activation of AKT, and so on which is going to lead to different response in the cell, rather than if EGF alpha binds, for example. And we can encode this kind of knowledge using, for example, direct graphs, in which we have like EGF binds to EGFR, which can then use activation of P3K and NKT and so on. Um, but we have also like uh, inhi inhibitions, like for example, a phosphatase can inhibit the action of AKT, so we can have also this kind of arcs in this diet graph, right? So this is a way in which can start building prior knowledge about the system under study. In this case, in the networks for for, for example. And 
it's important to have good, uh, well created resources where we can find this kind of data. Right? So there are many different databases that provide this kind of created um, data. Here is an example of the Peter Pierce signal impact with a type retreat from the senior database. And we can have this kind of uh, representation of the different uh, receptors uh, and the different proteins, uh, which live with different caskets of communication within the cell and the outcomes that can lead after this kind of, and depending on the activated pathway within the cell. But there is not this, the, the, the single resource that we, have, that we can find. Uh, there are many, uh, many more databases that we can, uh, that we can check. And so this, this is a problem, right? Because we have uh, many, we have uh, many uh, different databases in which we can retrieve information, and the, the, this this uh, makes things uh, more complicated to start with. So in order to alleviate uh, this problem, uh, in the group uh, there were uh, people developed Omnipath, which is an integrated access to many of those greater resources, including Senior, for example but many other uh, databases that are shown at the bottom of this uh, diagram. And the good thing about senior is that we can use this to uh, retrieve our prior knowledge network for, uh, for, for cells, for example, for, for mammalian cells. And uh, Omnipath integrates over uh, 100 knowledge resources and contains more than 2 million annotations uh, for entries for, for, for more than 20,000 human proteins and around 16,500 complexes. It includes information about protein-protein interactions, this kind of diagrams like uh, inhibition or activation uh, of uh, different proteins, also uh, post-translational modifications, um, stoichiometry, also annotations of the, of, uh, of the proteins uh, with respect to cellular localization or, or pathway activity and this kind of thing. But um, you have more information if you're interested about this. Uh, in this web page, omnipathb.org, uh, with very nice documentation. And there are also bindings uh, to interact and to retrieve information from Omnipath for Python, R, and also plugin for C2K. And this is a good starting point to, to start to retrieve this kind of information. Like the problem is when we, uh, we retrieve this kind of information that we can also filter by, for example, confidence in the, in the um, interactions between proteins and so on, depending on what's our interest. We end up having this kind of variable of many proteins connected to it, right? with many different types of activation inhibitor arcs and so on. But this is our context independent prior knowledge network that we are going to start as a base for using the other methods that I will present later in order to try to where the, the idea is to prune this space of, of um, possibilities and try to just get uh, a context specific signaling network that encodes, for example, the behavior of a cell for a particular uh, response or for a particular set of responses. So this is the idea, right? We have, we start with our prior network, uh, prior knowledge network uh, that we can retrieve from Omnipath. We have like different kind of omics data and we use those methods like Carnival and Selnop in order to uh, get only a sub-network of the signaling that encodes, for example, cell-specific uh, behaviors or patient-specific patient uh, condition-specific. And uh, once we have this kind of network, we can do more things with it. Like we can, for example, do simulations. We can imagine, okay, we have this drug which has this target, we perturb this node, what would happen? What would be the response in the network? And we can use also, as I explained before, those networks in order to extract uh, features that we can use for a different step, for example, for machine learning. So, um, there are two tools developed in the lab for this purpose, which are CellNot and Carnival. They do similar things, but uh, work from different types of data. And so CellNot is good when we have uh, proteomics data, also proteomics data, and we don't have like very, very large signaling networks. Sometimes uh, it's a little bit of creation before starting to work with uh, from the prior knowledge network because um, it's hard to train these kind of models. It's kind of slow. Um, but it can also handle, for example, uh, different time points. Like we can have like the continuous values for the response of different uh, of different targets. And Carnival, on the other side, uh, on the other side, it does something very similar: contextualization of signaling networks, but using gene expression data. Um, it's more efficient to work also with very large uh, networks in this case. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about cell cell not first. So. Um, in order to, to understand what CellNOP does, it's important to, 
to first move from uh, the net, this network representation of scenery network to something that is more um, something that we can use for computations, for making predictions. And I just took those slides from a previous uh, webinar that uh, uh, Vance and uh, from Institute Corey did. Uh, I put here the link on the bottom. I strongly suggest you check the video because it's, it's very nice and it's been really well those kind of concepts. I just took uh, those slides from, from his, his work. And here, uh, let's say this is our prior knowledge in which we have three species, right? Like A can activate B, but A can um, inhibit C and B can inhibit C. As well. So only with this, we cannot do too much, right? Because um, if I ask you what happened with C, if A is activated, only with this information, it's hard to say. So on top of the prior knowledge, we can add more information. For example, we can model a dynamic system by adding differential equations, which describes uh, the behavior over time of the, of the different species and how they interact with them. So imagine that we say, uh, so the rate of change of A over time is constant. It's not gonna change. There are no incoming edges. So let's say A doesn't change over time, but B um, can increase like its activity linearly with, with respect of activity of A and C, for example, for example, decreases with the activation of A and B and also by C itself, because otherwise we can end up having like negative values. And uh, on the right, we can see what happened if we try to simulate the system with some initial values. Let's say that A is always active and we start with B inactive as and C active. So since A doesn't change over time, we have always A which is active, but B is increasing linearly over time. I hope you can see my mouse. So it's increasing over time and as is increasing, it's suppressing also the activity of C. Of C. So after a few, um, let's say after a few time steps, we end up having a steady state, which is not gonna change in which B is, uh, is always active, is A is always active and C is inactive. But this is not the only way in which we can encode this kind of knowledge. We can see here, as you can see, we can have like parameters for the ordinary differential equations that are unknown, and we could learn for experimental data. But we can still simplify the system. Maybe we don't we don't care a lot about having a continuous uh, system over time, but we can discretize this over discrete time steps. And we care only about um, we have we want to have a more simplified version of, the, of this model, right? Only using one uh, like a Boolean system to represent if a species is active is one or if it's inactive is zero. And we can encode this with Boolean rules. For example, now we don't have kind of, of, of equation, but we just have that A is gonna be one constant over time, B equals A, and C is only inactive if both A and B are active, or, or this Boolean rule, which is equivalent. So starting with same, some kind of similar values, we have like A is gonna be uh, one uh, over time, it's not representing this plot, we have B and C. And in the ne next time step, as time step one, since B equals A, B is gonna be active, and the next time step, since A and B are active, C is gonna be suppressed and it's gonna be zero. And we are gonna reach the same kind of steady state, but with uh, but we put more simplification in the model. So this is what CELNOP is about. This just is a model simulator with different formalisms and parameter fitting from experimental data. So let's imagine that uh, we have different conditions. We can have like, um, let's say we have different conditions with we can have some Kind of perturbation or inhibition to some targets or to some proteins, and we want to measure other uh, proteins in the in this right? So we can have like uh, different conditions organized here by different uh, columns, and the different uh, rows corresponds to different measurements of the protein. And we have also our prior knowledge, as I explained before. Now, depending on the problem we want to model, we can decide which kind of formalization we're going to choose. I just mentioned two. We can use CNO. Uh, CNOR ODE in order to use uh, ordinary differential equations. We can choose cell of R, for example, if we want, if we're happy with a Boolean system to describe uh, the behavior. But there are other things, for example, there are also AMABOS uh, module, which, were, which was implemented in order to have, uh, for example, a continuous representation over time, but using a Boolean system, uh, Boolean rules. But we can have also both continuous or uh, simulation for steady state with passive rules. And the case I explained is continuous time and continuous, uh, continuous state. And um, then we can run, uh, sorry, we can uh, run CELNOP with, the training, uh, with this training data and select the context specific network that when we simulate this network, 
it can reproduce the observed experimental conditions. So in order to put this more into, in, in context, I'm gonna show you uh, a toy example using the cell knob R, which is, uh, you can find uh, uh, the code and uh, um, the documentation here at the bottom. Uh, all the, all the, the tools I'm presenting here are open source and, and you can, and there are tutorials as well for, for them. Uh, I put also here at the, at the top the, the, the link to the materials that are uploaded as well to, to the premise web page, which you can follow the different tutorials for the different tools. So imagine that in this little example, we have a very toy prior knowledge network, uh, which is represented here at, at, at the right side of the slide. And we have all the, so this prior knowledge, sorry, with this prior knowledge network can be encoded, it's encoded in C files, which are just text, plain text files that have this kind of a structure, like EGF activates RAS, it's positive edge, or for example, AKT inhibits MEP. So this is the representation of this kind of file. Then we have, to, we have to load the data. And in the data, we have some stimuli. Uh, for example, in this case, we can have uh, DNF alpha and EGF as a stimuli. And we can have also some different inhibitors that, uh, that inhibit those proteins. And then uh, our experimental conditions can be combinations of those. Like what happens if we have this, uh, the EGF stimuli, but we have an inhibition of the P3K, for example. So those are uh, our, our conditions. And the measurements are the nodes in blue, which are the rows of, the, of this matrix of experimental data. Once we have this, we have some steps. Uh, ahead that we have to do before training. First, we have to pre-process the network. Uh, I'm not gonna get too much into details. We have more in the, in the documentation, but basically it has to transform, transform the prior knowledge network into a Boolean, uh, into a logic uh, signaling network by uh, adding some missing AND gates for, for the different uh, proteins and so on. And once this net, and also do some simplifications in order to improve the performance of the network. Once um, this is pre-processed, we can train uh, the network to the data, trying to select a subnetwork which can reproduce the experimental data and also learning other type of parameters. For example, we have ODEs, which for the system we have more parameters to learn. And once uh, the training is done, we can just show, here's, uh, we show, for example, how well it does uh, the network that we obtain after the training. So on the right, you have the different conditional experiments. Black means that, this is um, activated that white is inactivated, which uh, represents the different experimental conditions that we have. And the measurements that are with uh, this um, the, the black line and the dashed line in blue is the simulation of the uh, fitted network. And you can see also that some nodes fit well and so other nodes can reproduce the activation of this protein, for example, here, just because some edge in the prior network were removed just in order to illustrate that Sometimes it's, in, it's not possible to um, perfectly fit uh, the data we have. And we can also plot uh, the network, like in this case, uh, in which uh, we show uh, in, in, in a light ray, for example, the nodes, uh, the edges that were not selected in the final result. So here we are showing the contextualized uh, signaling network that can reproduce the experimental data that we provide. Um, so one limitation of, of this kind of methods is like, like the contextualization of the networks is very time consuming. So that work well, but as we increase the size of the, of the network or we increase the number of parameters, the time to convergence is increases as well. Um, this is a problem when we want to, for example, contextualize thousands of, uh, let's say imagine we'll have single cell data, we want to have contextualized model for each cell, or we have thousands of patients and we want to have like custom models for each one. So this takes time. Sometimes we need to use like supercomputation to accelerate this kind of thing. And this is something that we are working also in the context of the permit project, trying to improve this. So we are developing new solvers that can exploit different levels of parallelism in the HPC. Um, so one, one approach that we are doing is also developing solvers that can train those networks uh, by splitting the computation across different nodes in which each node is gonna uh, perform a, a partially independent opti optimization of the solution. And for the optimization, we need to run the solver in order to evaluate how well the parameters fit to the data, right? And there is another level of parallelism that we can implement here. So we improve the simulators in order to exploit uh, shared memory parallelism using OpenMP. So we, like, we try to improve as much as we can the, the parallelization HPC by exploiting uh, 
um, distributed memory parallelism at the same time as we improve also, we exploit the um, shared memory parallelism of the, of the supercomputers. So now I'm gonna show you a few, uh, couple of, of um, real applications with Sunlock. Um, in this work by Tonetti, uh, in collaboration with von Miller from the University of Zurich, um, the idea of this work was to characterize the signaling landscape of uh, 62 uh, breast cancer cell lines with the purpose of trying to improve uh, drug sensitivity predictions on those, on those cells and having also a mechanistic view of, of what the, the, how is the, 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 the processing of information of those cells. So, um, so there are more than 80 million single cells that were measured and 30, 35 markers. We have different measurements, there are different measurements over a time span of 60 minutes. And all this data um, was used in order to build a specific models for each of the uh, breast cancer cell lines and to distribute also the responses of the different markers upon different perturbation and different combinations with five different kinase inhibitors. And um, so in this case, uh, cell not with ODEs uh, were used in order to, to create the models. So we have like differential equations for each of those nodes and we have those parameters on the edges. And so we have this kind of continuous representation of the states, uh, which is suitable because in this case, we have like continuous representation, with continuous measurement for, for over time for, for different markers. Um, the, the cells were um, stim stimulated with EGF and also they were measured with different combinations, as I said, of with five different uh, kinase inhibitors. And one of the purpose of, of this work was to show how predictive are the, the, the features that we can get from those um, contextualized uh, signaling networks for breast cancer, trying to improve also the predictions uh, of the sensitivity with, for different drugs on those cells. So in order to do that, um, different kind of features were tested in order to compare, like for example, standard feature from RNA-seq data or proteomics data, uh, how they perform using a machine learning system to predict uh, the drug responses to the cells and how it performs when we use parameters that were learned using cell -not. And one interesting thing, thing that uh, one interesting outcome that we show here is that when we have in the prior knowledge network, the, the group targets including the prior knowledge network, the responses or the features that we get from the contextualized networks are very representative, are very predictive of, of the, the different, uh, of the responses for the different drugs. So, um, so this is something like um, very interesting because we, we know that if we, the prior knowledge is good, we can have like accurate predictions of the response of the drugs. Of course, if we don't have the drug targets directly encoded in the prior knowledge set, we still can do things because we can detect, for example, if there is uh, an offside target, for example, or an offside effect of, the, of a drug on, this, on the part which is encoded in the prior knowledge network. If we find that the features are also predictive, this gives us an idea that even though those targets are not included in the prior knowledge network, there is some kind of effect inside the panel, maybe. In this other work uh, from Eduardi, published in Molecular Systems Virology in 2020, the idea was to use CellNOC to characterize um, ex vivo tumor um, biopsies from tumor cells from patients um, that were measured in a, a microfluid drug screening system in which uh, those um, those biopsies were analyzed ex vivo using the system in combination with different drugs. And here uh, we only measure, uh, we only have a one readout. In this case, it's caspate three activation upon perturbation of the cells with different combinations of drugs. But we can generate a lot of data with this. The only thing is, in this case, we only have one readout, uh, which is the caspase three as a proxy of cell apoptosis. Basically, if there is some activity in caspase three, you can, you can say, okay, maybe this drug is producing apoptosis on the cells. And uh, we use, um, so in this work, they use cell knots in order to create specific models for different tumors. And with the idea of then using those kind of models to do simulations on other kinds of drugs and on commissions of drugs. So we have an example here, how this looks like, like a contextualized network in which uh, we, can, we can know the drug targets of the, of the drugs used in the screening, but we only have, in this case, the caspase three activation. Uh, the good thing is um, with these models, we can do in silico simulations that uh, with different combination of drugs that were not screened by the system and trying to see if there is also activation of the caspase three 
in order to infer new treatments for the, uh, for the tumors that are personalized for the patient. And also this kind of combination of those were also validated both in vitro and in vivo uh, with Xenogram. So now I'm gonna move to Carnival. I'm gonna briefly talk a little bit about Carnival. But as I said uh, before, um, Carnival is, a, is also a method for network contextualization that works uh, this time uh, using gene expression data. And so the way in which it, it was designed and it works is uh, sometimes we, we don't have proteomics data, but we have like, let's say a control versus treatment um, uh, exper experimental experimental data like by vessel intracytomics, for example. And we with this kind of data, we can perform differential expression analysis. So for example, given a, a perturbation of the cell, um, let's say a drug with a known uh, drug target, we can measure uh, cells, uh, transcriptomics, uh, using transcriptomic cells in uh, basal conditions and, and after treatment and compute differential expression of, of, of the genes uh, after the perturbation. And with this, um, we can use this information in order to infer different things. So there are other tools that were developed as well from in the lab, which are Progeny and Dorothea. And Progeny can be used to infer pathway activity of the, on, on, different, uh, on different interesting pathways. And Dorothea can be used to infer transcription factor activities from gene expression data. So it's highlighted even in red. So basically, after treatment, we are on, we want to have some response, and with an Using Dorothea, we can get the regular for the different transcription factors. And using the changes in, in the gene expression of the, of the regular, we can infer, let's say, if the transcription factor is active or not, uh, using a statistical method for that. Basically, if most of the genes, let's say, simply most uh, of the genes are upregulated, we can infer that the transcription factor is activated at some degree, and we can have a value for that. And what Carnival does is it does some sort of causal reasoning in order to try to infer upstream the observed changes, what could happen from the, drug, uh, the, the perturbation to the, to the downstream targets. So basically, recovering uh, the whole signaling cascade of what could happen. Basically, if we, let's say, we infer that activity is very high of this transition factor because the, the targets are highly expressed, this would mean that if we know from the prior knowledge network that some protein can activate this transition factor, probably it's activated, right? And if this uh, protein can be uh, uh, at the same time activated by other, but uh, by via other pathway, we can just go upwards, um, trying to infer uh, the signaling cascade that leads to the observed changes. Um, of course, there can be many possibilities, but what Carnival does is trying to find a parsimonious model which can explain well using this kind of reasoning the observed changes. So this is the pipeline how it looks like. Basically, we can start, for example, with Omnipath just retrieving all the, the proteins and, and reactions that we, that we want. And then we, can we have to incorporate information about transcription factor activities that we can get from Dorothea. And um, optionally, we can add information about pathway activities that we can also extract with progeny. And we can put that into, a, into Carnival, which basically implements a mixed integer linear programming optimization problem, trying to select the most consistent contextualized scenery network that explains the observed changes uh, for this particular scenario. It can work, it, it could work also with basal gene expression data um, using also Dorothea to infer uh, um, transcription factor activities from, from, from uh, basal gene expression data. And this is what it would look like uh, the, the contextualizing it, for, for example, from the, from the perturbations to the to transcription factors. And um, actually, we are um, working on also with Carnival in the context of Hermit Coy. To do something similar as, as done before with CellNOP, um, trying to use Carnival in order to get uh, mechanistic features that can be uh, interesting, for example, for prediction of drug response. So we can have like different cell lines. We're working right now with GDSC data, in which we can have like different cell lines. We have basal gene expression data as well, um, and other kind of data. And then we can use Carnival to try to infer um, um, feature from trying to extract feature from 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 prior knowledge network uh, that encodes, uh, let's say, the, the state of, of, of the different cell lines, and then using those features to make predictions about drug responses, like let's say IC50, uh, by connecting uh, different approaches with a machine learning step. 
Um, with this, I would like to, to finish this presentation by thanking all the people uh, in the group, uh, also the, the people before were working on the development of the methods, and as well as all the collaborators, and also um, special mention to Ansan, uh, uh, Marco, and Laurent from Institut uh, with whom we are collaborating right now with the Quantum Software Mentoria as well, working also with Carnival and Mavos, and of course Attila, uh, my colleague, and Bartos, uh, who was working before as well uh, in the project. So um, with this, I think now we have some time for questions. I remember you have some buttons to, to submit your questions. I think Daniel is going to read it, read them. Um, and yeah, so thank you. And thanks, thank you so much for, for listening. Yeah, thank you, Pablo, for that, uh, for that presentation. Thank you very much. So yeah, we can start with uh, the uh, questions. Uh, so we already have a couple, but um, as Pablo just reminded you, you can use the button to, to submit your questions. So the first one we have that uh, arrived almost at the beginning was, can we use string database for the prior knowledge network? Um, I think I'm not completely sure, but I mean, uh, string contains like uh, protein protein interaction, right? I think. And um, if I think part of the, this information is already contained, as I showed before in Omnipath, uh, uh, which was um, at the beginning of the, yeah, here. I think uh, Omnipath already incorporates protein protein interaction. So, I mean, it could be, it could be used uh, because you can have also, you can retrieve information about inhibitor and activation of different proteins. Uh, if you can get that, you could use that as a prior knowledge uh, network. You just, as, as I showed uh, after, the files that we need to add to set up, for example, are kind of easy, it's just uh, connections between the different proteins, and the one, if this protein inhibits this protein, and uh, I'm not minus one, for example, if a protein inhibits other protein. So in theory, yeah, it can be protein, not, not only using Omnipath, but other kind of resources. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, can um, can you share some publications that link use publications link using these two tools? Um, yeah, I just referred to two here. Um, so let me yeah. go. To, yeah. So you have uh, there is this one here that I presented before, uh, published in Cell Systems in two thousand twenty one, uh, which is about the use of cell not. And uh, so the other one that they presented here is in microsystems by 2020, for example, this other application. Uh, with Carnival, we're still working on having something similar. I mean, we, I can refer to you. I mean, you can go to the, um, to the uh, web page that I put here before. I don't know if I will add. Uh, yeah, you can go to this web page in which there is also documentation for the different tools. And there are also uh, links and citations to the original publications where the methods were published, as well as updates uh, in some cases, and uh, you can will find you will find also um, more applications of these methods. There. Otherwise, okay. you can contact me as well, or I can I can send mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I can send more information. The, the, and just, the, my email is here in this slide. Okay, and just as a reminder as well that um, we are posting in um, in the Permit COE website. Uh, the recording and the slides. So from there, they can also uh, find the, the links to the, the, the reference to the publications. Okay, another question. Uh, great talk, thank you. You said Selenopt wouldn't work so well on large pathways or networks. What size would you recommend on input phosphoproteomics data or of prior knowledge network? Uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, hard. Our answer is not very easy to um, it's not very easy to answer because it's gonna depend on I mean it depends on, on the type of let's say there are many parameters that affect this right so we can have uh, as I showed before it depends on the of course the, the size of the prior knowledge network um, so in some cases in some of the applications we don't start as in carnival with the whole uh, herbal uh, with all the proteins but there is a previous uh, modeling step in which uh, the people uh, with biological uh, background uh, select uh, the parts of the network that are more interesting. So if you're going to measure 35, uh, let's say, markets, like in the case I, I explained before, uh, we all, we're going to restrict yourself to a part of the network that, that is interesting for your study. So 
in general, maybe, I mean, I cannot say maybe not more than maybe hundreds of proteins uh, to start with. Um, to have something that you can also interpret and understand, because this is also the purpose of that. Um, of course, then it depends on the type of, of, of approach. So fitting ordinary differential equation is harder than fitting a Boolean system. So um, I think it, it really depends on the, how, ma how many experimental conditions you have. I think the best thing is to, to try and monitor the convergence of the, of the of a lot with the, with your features. If you, I mean, you can stop the, the uh, after a few iterations, after so, uh, after a month of time, and see how well the result re represents experimental data. If after a few hours the result is very bad, it means that the convergence is going to be probably very slow, and maybe it's worth to try to prune a little bit prior to the network to just focus on the more restricted part. But uh, yeah, it's um. It's hard to answer because it, it requires a little bit of work with uh, with a particular case and some kind of define. Okay. okay, thanks for the answer. Another question: Can you use um, uh, wait scRNA sec dataset as experimental system? Yeah, you could. Um, so in single cell, I mean it's. You can, in that, in that case, I mean, you have to choose Carnival because as I explained, so the two different tools have different purposes. Uh, well, of course, if you have like, for example, single cell and proteomics, you, can, you could use also cell lock. I showed before an example of that. Uh, if the amount of data is very large, you can, for example, average across single cells. But um, with Carnival, it's possible as well to use single cell RNA seq data. Um, it's faster than you can, and, also, it can be distributed across, for example, it's a supercomputer, so each cell line can be a different independent task. And it works in the same way. Um, let me go to the, this kind of slide that I, I have for the work. So with, with single cell data, um, it depends if we have like original data or not in the single cell system. But if we have, for example, gene differential gene expression data uh, with single cell, we can exact, do, follow the same kind of, of pipeline for that. Like we can estimate restriction factors from the single cell expression data. And from this and prior knowledge using Carnival, we can just infer uh, contextualized network from that. Uh, differences would be, I mean, it depends on the coverage of the single cell. I mean, um, if you have a very bad coverage and maybe it's less reliable the, the estimation of the transition factors, uh, the activity of transition factors, but I, I don't think so. So I think it's perfectly fine, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, also, they ask uh, if does Carnival support uh, attack sec and chip sec data? Uh, I'm just thinking how it would be possible to use this kind of data. I'm not aware of um, uh, of using that kind of data in an example. So I, I I'm not I'm not I'm not sure if I don't know how it's possible to do that. Right now, I, I don't know if maybe one colleague is connected to this webinar. Maybe they can say more about this. In my experience, I never, I never did that. I, I don't know how it could be possible to integrate that. Okay. Um, okay. So another question is: Do you have a Python li library of Selenopt? Um, Selenopt is implemented in R, so there is no. Um, Python implementation of, of Selenop. In any case, uh, also in the context of permit GoE, we're working on containerization of the different methods, which could, uh, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not completely sure what, why is this question, I mean, what's the, the, the final purpose of this question, but if the idea is to integrate, for example, Selenop in a bigger pipeline, for example, in Python, um, it's complicated, I mean, it could be, could be done by using uh, bindings to R, or by content by using a containerized version of Selenop, uh, which could be called through um, different APIs. For example, we we're working on creating security containers for Selenop, uh, also for Carnival. Um, there are APIs for Python that could uh, be used in order uh, to to pass the inputs to to the software and get outputs in a pipeline made in Python, for example. Uh, but there is no implementation, native implementation of cell of cell not in, in 
in, in Python. There are for Carnival. So for Carnival, there is an implementation in Python and in R as well, uh, with integration of different kinds of solvers, but not for Solvers. Okay. Uh, more questions. Uh, um, molecular interactions are in a network with cellular interactions. Can we identify these cellular interactions that may help in linking the changes in the cell? I'm not completely sure about this question. I mean, can, can you repeat that? Because I didn't yeah. get the point that. Molecular interactions are in a network with cellular interactions. Can we identify these cellular interactions that may help in linking the changes yeah. in the cell? Okay, if I if I understood, I mean, I think the question refers to, I mean, uh, interaction between different, maybe communication between cells as well. Uh, there are, I mean, there's some work uh, in this line. And for example, in um, it depends also, I mean, if we can encode everything into a prior knowledge network, it would be possible in theory. Um, for example, I showed before on um, with uh, Omnipath, um, you have here on the right there are also uh, information about uh, cell communication, and there are also other tools uh, uh, developed in the lab. You can find them also in the GitHub repository of the lab for cell cell cell, cell, cell communication. Um, I mean, the, the, there is research in this line, like how to extend this approach. The problem is that as you start to, to expand the size of the interaction you want to predict. It's more hard to get something sometimes meaningful and interpretable. But yeah, it is uh, this something that we are for the future. Okay, okay. Um, another question with Selenop and the previous knowledge network built from a signal, uh, sorry, signal trans the pathway. Sorry, one second, because this is a, a, a tricky one, how it's phrased. With Selenopt, a, a previous knowledge network built from a signal transduction pathway experimental data must be from proteomics, not transcriptomics. Is this correct? Mm, yeah, I think, yeah, the focus of Selenopt is using uh, proteomics data to, to extract uh, contextualized networks from the brain of yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, they also ask, uh, where can I find more details on how to construct the list file for Selenop R? Um, yeah, I would refer to the um, uh, to the link I show here. I mean, in the both in the Celslab group web page, uh, there are tutorials uh, step by step of how to um, import the import this kind of data, the structure of this data. Also, in the publication of the tool that we can find also in the web page of the lab. Uh, here, I mean, you have here the links at the bottom uh, with, uh, there is a tutorial as well inside the web page to follow step-by-step -step these kind of three examples. Um, and also in the Premier Query web page, uh, there are the same kind of materials that you can check and there you can see I mean, how these files look like, how to create them and how to, how to use them. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks also for the for those for the reminder of those links. Um, so for the moment, we don't have more questions. We can wait a couple of minutes. Uh, we have a few people saying thank you for the for the webinar. That it was it was very good. Um, I, I may I ask meanwhile um, uh, one question before coming to this slide, which is you are basically have shown about. Um, human data can this be can these tools be used for other organisms yeah um it can be used uh for example for mouse because in um there are um orthodox translations in omnipath for mouse and in omnipath as well for rat i think with uh, to some extent but especially for mouse um and then for example for uh, there is also orthodox translations for um dorothea for the estimation of, of transcription factors, and I think as well for progeny. Um, so for example, it could be used, Carnival could be used with, uh, with mouse data, with mice, and also um, cell locked, uh, yeah, cell locked as well. The thing for other organisms, we should have a created prior knowledge network, but at some point, for example, it's not included the Omnipath, uh, as far as I know. 
Um, but yeah, it could be possible to do for, for mouse. Okay, okay, thanks. So yeah, for the moment, I think we have no more questions. So I would just like to um, remind everyone that um, the next webinar for the 3rd of March is already scheduled on identifying two more cells at the single cell level through machine learning. Uh, the presenter will be uh, Atun Alkali from the MDC in Berlin. And the um, uh, next webinars for, for spring will also be uh, announced soon. So I think with this, we can close the session. So thank you once again, Pablo, for uh, this uh, very good webinar. And um, see you in the next session. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.